Hey everyone. So today we're going to be talking about proofs involving sets. And uh, this is following chapter 8 of our text. So a lot of times in math, I mean surprisingly often, uh, as you'll see in future courses, we want to prove something of the form uh, A contained in B, where A and B are sets. And just remember, uh, A contained in B, what that means is that uh, A, little a in A, implies that A is in B. All right, so ultimately, uh, proving a statement like this is going to come down to assuming that A is in A, and then we have to show that that entails that A is in B. So the basic first question then is, well, how do we verify that some element A is in B? Uh, let me see here, sorry. Okay, well, uh, this depends. So there's two common situations. Uh, so the first situation uh, is, well, so it depends on how our set B is presented to us, basically. So we have two situations, uh, generally speaking. Actually, there's really going to be sort of three, but the most common ones are these two. And I'll talk about the third one in a, in a minute. Uh, but generally, you specify a set by saying it's the set of elements uh, satisfying some property, which is given by an open sentence here, um, or somewhat more specifically, you could say it's the elements in a pre-existing set which satisfy a particular property. Um, so such that, oh, sorry here, let me, uh, such that P of X. Okay, so these are the two common ways of, um, of denoting sets that you'll often see. Uh, so in this case, so in this first case here, if we wanna show that um, A is in this set here, we need to show that uh, P of A is true. So this so A is gonna be in that set if and only if P of A is true. Over here, an element A will be in this set if and only if A is first of all in S and P of A that is true. Okay, so in this case there would be two things to verify. All right, so let me uh, zoom out here. Maybe, there we go. Just have to bear with me while I uh, <laughs> get used to this new technology. Okay, so for example, so for example, uh, let's take a look. So, so as an example, we could be talking about the set A of elements X such that X is in the natural numbers and seven divides X. So in this case, so in this case we look up here, well this sort of fits our first model and we see that our P of X is just the sentence uh, that X is in N 
and 7 divides x. Right, so if we wanted to verify that a particular element is in this set, we have to verify that x is a natural number and that 7 divides x additionally. So we could also describe this set in the, in the, uh, in the second way as well. We could have, you know, you could easily describe this set as the set of x in n such that uh, 7 divides x. So, uh, I mean, you could think about this in either of the, the two ways, but we're thinking about it in terms of the first one. Uh, in any case, uh, so you see, for example, that uh, 14 is an element of our set A because 14 is a natural number and 7 divides 14. Uh, we see that 8 is not an element of A uh, because, well, 8 is a natural number, but 7 does not divide 8. And also, uh, say, negative 21 is not an element of A. And that is because uh, negative 21 is not a natural number, even though uh, 7 divides negative 21. So we have to satisfy both of the properties to be in A. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Just getting used to this, uh, this new stuff. All right. Uh, so that's, that's one example. Uh, another example. Uh, we could look at the set of a, uh, set A. This would be the subsets of the natural numbers. So we're talking about elements of the power set of the natural numbers, such that. Oh, I just I just realized that I, in our first example, I was defining A. I used a, a vertical line as the such that. That's the other common convention. Um, the book tends to use the colons, so sorry if that confused you, but uh, that is a common alternate notation that you should be used to. Um, anyway, back to this example. The uh, We're going to look at the set of uh, elements of the power set of the natural numbers such that the cardinality of that set is 3. Um, so in this case, uh, we're in the second situation, and that uh, so our S here is equal to the power set of the natural numbers. And our open sentence, P of X, uh, this is cardinality of X equals 3. All right, so uh, for example, then uh, 10, the subset 10, 100, 1,000 is in A. Um, and that's because, first of all, this is a subset of the natural number, so it's in our set S here, and also the cardinality is 3. So we had to check two things, right? We have to check the, uh, the, condition, uh, the condition here. Uh, so we had to check this condition, and then we had to follow up by checking that condition. Okay, so that's uh, that's an element of A, um, but something like, for example, uh, we have 10, 100, 1,000, 1,001. That's not in A because it is a subset of the natural numbers, so it satisfies this condition, but it does not satisfy that condition because it has cardinality equal to 4. And uh, something like uh, negative 1, 0, 1, that's not a uh, element of A because even though the cardinality is 3, so this time so this time it satisfies this condition, but it does not satisfy that condition because negative 1 is not a natural number. Okay. So that's... Another example of how you, uh -oh. I know these are attached now. All right. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Oh, this is gonna be fun. And then another uh, another example a 
Okay, you can consider the set of uh, set B. Uh, this is pairs x, y, in z cross z, such that x is equivalent to y mod five. Hmm. I wonder how far apart I have to make these things to be able to do that. Uh, right. So. Okay, so in this case, right, our S is Z cross Z. This is the second model. And our P of X, well, actually, I guess we have two variables here, X and Y. So our P of X will be X is equivalent to Y mod 5. And so, for example, um, 3... 28, that pair is in B. And that's just because, uh, well, 3 minus 28 is negative 25, and that's divisible by 5. Um, so, and so we have x equivalent to y mod 5, and x and y are both integers. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an element of B, but uh, for example, 12, 16 is not an element of B. Uh, because 12 minus 16 is not divisible by 5. Hmm. So I... So weird. Some of these... I'm really trying to figure out how this thing works. Okay, and uh, then slightly more sophisticated here, um, we can show that for, so if, so let n, let n be some integer, uh, we can show that whatever integer that is, that this pair of integers is in B. And that just follows because uh, 4n plus 3 minus 9n minus 2 is negative 5n plus 5, which is 5 times negative n plus 1. So we see this integer here is divisible by 5. Um, and so that tells us that uh, this pair of integers is equivalent mod 5. Right, so nothing too uh, nothing too strenuous here, uh, showing that an element, a certain element, is uh, contained in a given set. And so somewhat different from above. Somewhat different from above uh, is if we have, for example, a set of numbers. So uh, let s s be a set of numbers. So we could be talking about natural numbers or integers or rational numbers or real numbers. And then we can define the set A to be the set of f of x such that x is in S. And this f of x is a formula. of some kind. So some uh, like algebraic formula that we can apply to these numbers to get new numbers. So for example, uh, so example, we could consider, say, A uh, to be the set of, uh, let's see here, um, the set of 3x cubed plus 2, such that x is in Z. Okay, so uh, so saying that that A is in our set A here, that means that there exists some integer, say B, such that. 
such that a equals 3b cubed plus 2. Okay, so our a is of the form specified uh, in that first part of the, the set there. Uh, so for example, uh, negative 22 we can see is in a. And why is that? Uh, well, negative 22 is equal to 3 times negative 2 cubed plus 2. Right, 3 times negative 8 plus 2. All right, so this negative 2 is our b, so we found a b uh, such that 3b cubed plus 2 is equal to our given a. Right, okay, uh, so we could also, for example, you can argue that uh, 0 is not an element of a uh, because there is no b uh, such that 3b cubed plus 2 is equal to 0, where, where b is an integer. So uh, so there's, so let's suppose, there were a b in z such that 3b cubed plus 2 were equal to 0. Well, then uh, b cubed would be equal to negative 2 over 3. But b cubed is an integer. Right? And this is a contradiction. Okay, so if there are, so if a were so if zero were in this set a, uh, there would be a b like this, but then that would mean that negative two-thirds was an integer, and that doesn't make any sense. All right. So those are the, so, so basically this is a, a third type of set. So, so there's some common ways of describing sets, um, and these are the ways to verify that a given element is in these, is in a set of this form. Okay. Um, so let me see here. Let me try to I don't understand this. Why are these lines separate? I don't get it. This is very frustrating. Okay, well, I'm probably just gonna, just gonna move this out of the screen. Okay, so now we're going to look at proving A is contained in B for various examples of A and B. Okay, so there's three, uh, three ways to do this, generally speaking. Um, so you can, so how to prove that A is contained in B. Um, so remember, this means that if A is in A, then A has to be in B. So really, this is a conditional statement. Um, so this is the conditional statement. So A is contained in B is equal to the conditional statement. A, uh, sorry, is equal to the conditional statement a in A implies A in B. All right, so we have direct proof as a method. Right, so you can do direct proof. Uh, you could do, and right, so that would just be assume A is in A and then show that A is in B. Uh, you can do the contrapositive. Um, which would be to show that A not in B implies A not in A. Um, or you could do a contradiction. So 
So that would be to assume that A is in A and A is not in B and then drive uh, some contradictory statement. So any of these would be a valid way of proving that A is contained in B. Uh, and generally, uh, the direct proof is going to work best. Um, I mean, I think all the examples we're going to look at it are going to be direct proof. But presumably, there could be situations where other techniques, uh, these other techniques of contrapositive or contradiction would work. Okay, so let me see if I can just scooch that up to the top there. Okay, so let's look at a first example. So we're going to prove, let me make this size smaller. So we're going to prove that the set of integers that are divisible by 18, uh, that that's contained in the set of integers which are divisible by 6. Okay, which seems like a pretty simple and obvious statement, so there shouldn't be anything difficult to prove. So here's our proof. So this is a conditional statement, so we assume, right, so we start with assuming that we have something in the first set, and we're just going to show that it's in the second set. So assume that A is in our first set. So this just means, just sort of unwrap what that means, then A is an integer and 18 divides A. And just further unwinding what that means, uh, A is equal to 18 times K for some integer K. Well, where are we trying to go? We're trying to say that 6 divides our A here, right? Because that's what it would mean to be in the second set. You just take a glance at the second set up there. Um, and so what we'll do is just there, right, therefore A equals, well, we got the 18K, and then we'll just want to factor a 6 out here. So we got 6 times 3K. So we see that 6 divides A. Okay, as, uh, and then I guess we can just say, just to be totally complete, uh, since A is an integer and 6 divides A, A is an element of the second set there. And that completes our proof. I'm hoping this all sticks together. Okay, great. I really gotta master how this works. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, and then for the next example, uh, there's the book does this in a slightly different way, but I'll just remind us of a, well, it was actually a, a problem that was on the workshop uh, from last week, and it's a consequence of Bezos' lemma. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll just quickly go through that, or sorry, Bezos' identity. Um, and so this is just a little proposition that we'll use 
now and probably use in the future. It's just a very useful proposition. Um, and it's also related to a problem that was on your test. So uh, let's, uh, let's say, I suppose K, L, and N are natural numbers. If K divides N and L divides N and K and L are relatively prime, so that means oops, uh, the GCD of K and L is equal to 1, then K times L divides N. Okay, so the uh, so the sort of converse of this is always true without the GCD part. If KL divides N, then K and L both have to divide N. But it's not always the case that K and L dividing N implies their product divides N. You, you need this extra bit about the GCD in order for that to go through. So you, uh, we talked about how to construct a, a counterexample um, to that. I think last week. Okay, so this this proposition is relatively uh, well easy to prove with just a little bit of a trick. Uh, so let's take a look at it. So uh, suppose k divides n, l divides n, and the GCD of k and l is equal to one. Uh, then n equals k times p and n equals uh, l times q and also by Bezos lemma uh, we have k u plus l v is equal to 1 uh, for some for some p q u and v uh, in the uh, in the integers, I guess. Okay, so uh, I guess maybe I should uh, I should make that little remark there. Um, so we use Bezos lemma. Sorry, I keep saying that Bezos identity. Oh no, why is this like this? I don't know why this is doing this to me. Okay, um, so where we're trying to go here is we wanna say that KL divides N. So we would like some equation that says N is equal to KL times something. Uh, and what we have here is we have an equation that says one is equal to something. So we can easily go from such an equation to an equation involving N by just multiplying both sides by N. So uh, it follows that so N is equal to n k u plus n l v. Right. And then we want to make a k l pop up on the right side here. So each of the terms, our first term has a k but not an l, and the second term has an l but not a k. Uh, but the thing is, is that n contains both a k and an l inside of it uh, by the divisibility. So we just look up. So this. Uh, First term here, we look at n is equal to l q, right? So this is l q k u, and then this term, or the second term already has an l, so we look at the k equation. N is a k p l v, and so we can factor k l out here. So we have q u and p v. So k l divides n as required. 
All right, so that's a that's a fun little proof there using Bezos identity. Um, and so that tells us that whenever we have relatively prime numbers dividing some other number, then their product has to divide that number, and that's an incredibly useful, uh, incredibly useful proposition. I'm trying to get this screen to move, and it's not doing it. There we go. Okay. Hmm. No. I'm going to be fluent with this someday. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to end up using this proposition in the next part. So we'll show, we'll do another proof that a set uh, contains, is contained in another set. So here we're going to prove, so here's another example. So we're going to prove that the set of integers Uh, wait, let me see. I'm going to have to give myself more room here. So we'll prove that it's actually an intersection of sets. So, so our set is going to be an intersection of two sets. So the intersection of the set of integers divisible by 2 with the set of integers divisible by 9 we're going to prove that that is contained in the set of integers, which is divisible by 6. Oh my god. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> All right, this app is driving me nuts. Hmm. I can't seem to move things without moving this whole thing. That's great. frustrating hmm all right I wanted to give myself more room but uh, I don't know this thing is really not cooperating with me all right anyway let's uh, let's just make use of the room we have down here okay so suppose to begin with that we have an A in this intersection here. So A is in the intersection of the two given sets. So what does it mean when an element is in the intersection of two sets? It means that it's in both sets, right? So then, so thus, A is an element of this first set, and A is an element of the second set. Oops. It's still not letting me. This is so frustrating.
I'm just trying to give myself more room, guys. Help me out here. Okay. Okay, now we have some more room to maneuver here. Uh, so we have our A is in both sets. Well, A is in the first set, so therefore, so thus, therefore, A is an integer, two divides A, and nine divides A. All right, well, because, so we're gonna use the previous proposition. So because the GCD of two and nine is equal to one by the previous proposition, here all right anyway sorry still uh, I'll become more fluent with this soon uh, so uh, by the previous proposition well 2 and 9 are relatively prime things dividing a so it follows that 18 divides a right their product divides a uh, by the previous proposition 2 times 9 which equals 18 that must divide a Right. Okay. Well, I mean, it basically sort of immediately follows that six is going to divide a as well, and that's because we already did this example here. So if you refer back to this example, we showed that uh, that the set of integers divisible by eighteen is contained in the set of integers divisible by six. Right. So we could uh, just draw on that knowledge if we needed to. Uh, so by the previous example, by the previous example, six divides a immediately follows. And since a is an integer, A is an element of, well, the set of integers, such that 6 divides x. Okay, so there's our second example of showing how a set, uh, how to prove a set is contained in another set. Okay, please don't give me trouble here. Just gonna move that off there. All right, so let's uh, just quickly take a look at some uh, general general set containment facts. There's a ladybug crawling all on me. Cool. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, so there's some simple general set containments that are useful and uh, that we don't really... I'm not going to provide detailed proofs for. I mean, they're really one-liners. Uh, they're the kinds of things that you should just try for yourself. Um, it's really just a means, a, a matter of um, unwrapping some definitions. So the first one would be that for any set A, uh, A is contained in a union of A and B. Right, because the union of A and B is the uh, 
right? So, so if A is contained in A, well, then A is contained in A or B, right? Because A is contained in A. Uh, so the, the containment there immediately follows. Similarly, uh, we also have that A intersect B. That's contained in A for any sets A and B. Right? Because uh, if A is contained in A intersect B, that means A is contained in A and A is contained in B. But in particular, A is contained in A. And so it follows that our, the A we started with is in, is in A. And a third one, A minus B, that's contained in A. Remember, A minus B, that's the set of things in A, which is not in B, right? So if you take a little A, which is in A minus B, that means it's in A, but it's not in B. But in particular, it's in A, right? So, it, so the containment automatically follows. And then a, another rule that's useful um, is if A is contained in B and B is contained in C, then that implies that A is contained in C. Right? And that almost doesn't, doesn't require much comments. Uh, it just says everything in A is in B and everything in B is in C. Well, then everything in A has to be in C. Okay, so those are useful general facts. So they'll come in handy in a second here, or well, at least some of them will come in handy in a second here. Uh, so we'll look at an example, another example. We're gonna prove Uh, the following. So let A and B be sets. Uh, then the power set of A union the power set of B and that's contained in the power set of A union B. So I can draw you a picture here so you see why this is kind of obvious. Um, so let's say our A and B, we'll do Venn diagrams. Mm, let's see here. Uh, so blue and yellow make green, right? So let's uh, let's do blue. So let's say, oh yeah. So this is let's say this is A over here. This is B over here. And so elements that are strictly in A, we can make them blue. Elements that are strictly in B will make them yellow. And elements in the intersection here, which are in both A and B, we can make green. Uh, blue plus yellow is green. Okay, so now if we take a look at uh, the different sides of this equation here that we're trying to prove, um, the left-hand side is the union of these power sets. So that is, it's the we're looking at the subsets of A, all the possible subsets of A, and you're throwing that together with all the possible subsets of B. Uh, so, uh, so like a possible subset of A, right? You could sort of draw a circle around like it's all the the blue and the green that falls inside of that, right? So that would be one way to make it a subset of A, just sort of abstract, extracting those elements from A there. Um, so that would be uh, blue and green. So basically, power set of A is all of the subsets you can make by combining the blue and the green. Um, the power sets of B are all the subsets you could make by combining the yellow and the green, right? So the only so the types of things you can get from the left-hand side is uh, subsets that just have blue and green or subsets that just have the yellow and the green. Whereas the uh, power set of A union B, well, A union B is you're allowed to 
So A union B is anything that's blue or green or yellow. So in the power set of A union B, uh, you can make any choice you want, right? So you can cut across any of these boundaries here. But in particular, right, you don't have to cut across the boundaries. You could just decide to combine the blue and the green or just the yellow and the green. In other words, um, in other words, you can uh, the elements of the power set of A, which would be things like this, um, those are going to be in the power set of A union B. And the uh, things that just combine the green and the yellow, those are going to be in the power set of A union B. Uh, but there's going to be things in the power set of A union B which are not in the union of the power sets because you can combine uh, the blue and the green and the yellow. All right, but so just thinking about this, this picture um, can help to get some intuition for why this is this is the case. So here's our, uh, our proof. Okay, so, so A and B are sets. Uh, we have to show this set containment with the power sets. So we'll let X be an element of the left-hand side. So that's where we start with our, uh, our set containment. You take something which is in the left-hand side, so that's gonna be in the power set of A union power set of B. And what that means is, well, then X is in the power set of A or, so your union is an or, uh, or X is in the power set of B. And what this means, so X being in the power set of a, that means that X is a subset of A, or X is a subset of B. Okay, and so what can we do with that? Well, so we have sort of two cases here. Um, and so we'll first suppose that we have X contained in A. And where are we trying to go? We're trying to say that this X is an element of the power set of A union B, right? Which is to say that X is a subset of A union B. And what we have is that X is a subset of A, right? But A is always a subset of A union B, if you look up here at our uh, general fact here, right? So we'll just use that. So, so we have the X is contained in uh, A, but, uh, A is contained in A union B, so we find X is contained in A, which is contained in A union B, and that is to say that X is an element of the power set of A union B. So basically here in the in this proof we have um, that our so we start with our x contained in a right so you have oh whoops so we have a from our picture up there Uh, if you if you have a subset of a right so you choose some elements here well I can think I can view that as a subset of a or I could just by now sort of enlarging the picture so adding on B here right so this is the picture of I'm just focusing on a to begin with but then if I add on B now I can view that subset X as not just a subset of A, I can view it as a subset of A union B. So that's, a, that's the move we're, we're doing in the formal proof. So that's sort of what the, uh, the picture that corresponds to our proof. Um, and we're not quite done the proof yet because we only looked at the case uh, A contained in B, but the case A, X contained in, sorry, X contained in A, we have to look at the case X contained in B as well. Um, so now, Uh, next, oh gosh. Uh, 
Oh my god, I did it again. Okay, pen, black. Next, suppose that x is contained in b. Uh, then we have similarly, you know, a was contained in a union b, but we also have b contained in a union b. All right, it's the same rule, just uh, just sort of interchanging the rules of a and b. Uh, so x is contained in b is contained in a union b. Uh, that is x is contained in the power set of a union b. Okay, so that completes that proof. What else do we have here? Okay. I guess I'll just uh, throw that off there. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, we're going to prove that, uh, so suppose A and B are sets. And prove the conditional statement uh, that if the power set of A is contained in the power set of B, then A must be contained in B. And to actually give two proofs of this, the first proof is the one that's given in the book. Okay. So here's the first proof. Uh, so suppose so yeah, this conditional statement, so we have to suppose the, um, the, the, the initial condition there, so that we have to suppose that the power set of A is contained in the power set of B. And then we need to show that A is contained in B. So we need to take an element in A and then show that it's in B. Uh, so we, we're supposing the power set, the one power set is contained in the other, and we're going to let little a be in big A. All right, so that sets us up to show that a is in B. Okay, so we have this element in A, and what are we given? We're, we're given something about the uh, power set of, of these sets A and B, right? Okay, so let's see. So what can we do? Well, if A is in A, and so if you have an element in A, then what we can say is that the set containing that element is in the power set of A. So the set containing A is an element of the power set of A. Therefore, the set containing A is an element of the power set of B. Because the power set of A Oops, power set of A. A should probably. So this is just by our assumption. Well, this just says that, um, so thus, Right, yeah, so what are we trying to say? Well, so what we're trying to say is that A is in B, right? Okay, so since the since the set containing A is in the power set of B, uh, this just says that 
that this set containing A is contained in B. which says that A is in B. So it's really just unwinding the definitions, winding the, the def, unwinding the definition of power set and set containment. Okay, so that's basically the proof that's in the book. Um, the other proof, which I think is a little bit simpler, As you say, suppose, so this one's a little more direct. It doesn't take an element A in A and then show that it's in B. Uh, we just go sort of directly use what it means for the power set of A to be contained in the power set of B to conclude that A must be contained in B. Uh, so suppose that the power set of A is contained in the power set of B. Well, among the powers, the elements of the power set of A is the set A itself, right? Since A is an element of the power set of A, right? Because the whole set is a subset of itself. We find that A is an element of the power set of B. Okay, well, what does that mean? Um, so if you're an element of the power set of B, that means you're a subset of B, right? So this exact... means that A, so I'll just spell it out in words, that A is a subset of B, i.e. A is contained in B. All right, so those are <clears throat> a couple of proofs. So that's a second uh, proof, sort of general properties of sets. And so in these ones we don't we didn't have our sets our sets weren't described by some condition. This is just general properties of sets that hold uh, in particular properties about the power set. Okay. So now so that's so much for set containment for now. So now we're going to look at proving that A equals B, or A and B are sets. Okay, so A equals B means, just recall that A and B have the same elements. And what that means is that if A is an element of A, so i.e. A being in A implies that A is in B, and if something is in B, then it must necessarily be in A. All right, so in other words, just to translate this, this just means that A is contained in B and B is contained in A. Okay, so to prove that A equals B,
So what you do is you, so the first thing you do is you prove that A is contained in B. And so you're going to say, so like your proof is going to be, right, so this is the first thing, like one, one paragraph proving that A is contained in B, uh, second paragraph proving that B is contained in A, and then you can conclude the proof by saying, you know, since A is contained in B and B is contained in A, uh, it follows that. A equals B. All right, so that's the basic outline of such proofs. Okay, so let me uh, see if I can squish this down. Okay, so let's prove that the set of integers, which are divisible by 35, that that's equal to the set of integers, which are divisible by 5, intersected with the set of integers, oh boy, let's see how much room I have here. Set of integers divisible by seven, such that seven divides n. Okay, so First we'll show, and I guess uh, I guess maybe I'll just be explicit about this. We first show uh, yeah, so maybe maybe to shorten this up, let me just call this side A uh, and this side B. So first show that A is contained in B. So let a, little a, be an a. Okay, well, what that means is, so then a is an integer, and 35 divides a. All right, well, we have to show that A is in B, and to be in B, we have to show that, uh, that first of all, we're an integer, no problem there, um, and that we're divisible by five, and we're divisible by seven. So I, so I need to show that our A here is divisible by five and seven. So this uh, 35 divides A, well, principally, principally that means that, um, so thus, A equals 35 times K for some integer k. So we see that a is equal to, well, the divisible by 5, uh, so 35k, that's 5 times 7k, and 35k is also 7 times 5k. And thus, 5 divides a and 7 divides a. So it must be that a is in b. All right. Need some more room here. All 
All right, next we show that B is contained in A. So let B be in B. So thus, B is an integer. Uh, so B is an integer. Uh, 5 divides B. And Seven divides B. Well, five and seven are relatively prime. So since since the GCD of five and seven is equal to one, it follows from that proposition that follows from Bezos' lemma that we had uh, back in the beginning of the lecture, it follows that 5 times 7, which equals 35, divides b. Okay, so therefore, 35 divides b. Oh, sorry, no, that's what we just said. Uh, so therefore, b is in a. Right, so this is the criteria for B to be in A. Okay. So the uh, the if you look at the proof in the book, the book uses the fundamental theorem of arithmetic about uh, prime factorizations. But um, well, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is proven using uh, one of the main lemmas is uh, the. Uh, the proposition that we that we used here uh, in this in this proof. Uh, so, really, logically speaking, uh, this this proof is is simpler than the proof that the book gives. So, so, that, so that's why if you look at the proof in the book, you'll see something slightly different. Uh, just kind of aesthetically, I pr prefer this proof. Um, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, even though that's something I'm allowing us to assume ultimately. So, if you, you know, if you're doing some homework problem or something uh, or something on the exam you can assume the fundamental theorem of arithmetic I uh, I just kind of prefer to avoid using it if I can here so so I did all right anywho okay so here's another general example um, and maybe hmm I don't know how. Shoot. I need to work on. I need to work on this. <laughs> okay, so here's another thing. So suppose A, B, and C are sets, and C is not the empty set. If the Cartesian product of A and C is equal to the Cartesian product of B and C, then A must be equal to B. Okay, so this is sort of, a, this is analogous to, uh, so just kind of remark. This is analogous to the rule AC equals BC uh, implies A equals B uh, if C is not equal to zero in ordinary arithmetic. So this is a, a canceling on both sides type of law. So that's the 
first remark. Uh, second remark is that this definitely isn't true if, if C is the empty, empty set. So uh, this is not, not true if C equals the empty set uh, because for then, uh, so in this case, A cross C is equal to the empty set as well which is the same as b cross c uh, for any b and for any sets a and b right i mean you can't so uh the cartesian product of a and c is all of the ordered pairs with elements uh in the in the in the first part of the order pair coming from A, and then in the second part of the order pair, you take an element from C, but if C is the empty set, there's no element to take, so, so you have to have the empty set there. Um, okay, so anyway. Okay, uh, so suppose, so we're proving this conditional statement, so we'll suppose that A cross C equals B cross C. And we need to show that A equals B, right? So first we'll take an element of A and we'll show that it's in B. Uh, okay, so first we'll show that A is contained in B. So let A be in A. Now what we have to do is uh, show that this A is in B, and all that we have is that the Cartesian products, uh, A, A times C and B times C are equal. So we have to involve the Cartesian product somehow. And one way you can do that uh, is you can take uh, some element in C. So C is not the empty set. Uh, so since C is not equal to the empty set, let c, little c, be some element of big C. Okay, well then, then I can consider the pair a comma c, that's in a times c. Right? But since A times C is equal to B times C, right, that's contained in uh, B times C. Right? Well, if AC is in B times C, right, the, the things in B times C are the things such that the first component is in B and the second component is in C. Right? So the only way this could be happening is if A is in B. Right? So by the definition, of B times C, A is in B. Okay, so we took A and A and we showed that A is in B. Okay, so A is contained in B. So new, new paragraph. Uh, so next we show that B is contained in A. So let B be in capital B. And consider, just as above, and the proof is more or less the same, uh, the pair BC, which is in capital B times C, where C, little c and c is the same as in the paragraph above.
So since b times c, well, that equals a times c, so it's contained in a times c, we find that bc is in a times c. Again, by definition, of a times c, b is in a. Thus, b is contained in a and combined with a being contained in b, we have that a must be equal to b. And that's the proof. All right, let's do, whoops, let's do one more. So given sets A, B, and C, following equation holds that A crossed with B intersects C, that's equal to uh, A crossed with B intersect a crossed with C. Once you see that there's a distributive law happening here, right? A times B intersect A cross uh, A times C. Right. Okay, so that's how you can one way to read this proposition here. Mm. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah, and you can uh, visualize this proposition as well. Um, so, if you think about your, uh, you can kind of just draw a generic picture. Um, so, here's the generic picture I kind of have in mind um, is that. Yeah, so you have your uh, your set A down here in red. Um, you have B here, and well, let's say yeah. So one of these is B and one of these is C. So I guess let's just say this is B uh, and this is C, and then the green is the intersection. So that's B intersect. C. And so if you look at uh, A cross B intersect C in this picture, that should be like here. Right? So it's so the first coordinate is in A and the second coordinate is in B intersect C. Right? So you get that bit there. And well, let's see, I don't have enough colors for that but that's also equal to okay so that's that's one way to, to think about it and but thinking about it on the, the right hand side right you have a cross B so a cross B would be like this big thing here and then a cross C that would be this overlapping box here Right? And what's in the middle is the intersection of those two. But that's exactly the thing that we already highlighted before when we did the, uh, the left-hand side. Right? So that intersection there, that's, um, that's A, A cross B intersects C, as we saw before. Okay, so at least 
picture wise, uh, this all seems to make good sense. All right, so we can take a look at the proof of this. Okay, so uh, let uh, so we'll let well let's see here. So we so we have this Cartesian product on the left hand side. So we need to take something in the left hand side and show that it's on the right hand side. All right, so we'll say let well. Okay, so the first coordinate is in A, so we'll call that A. The second coordinate is in the intersection of B and C, uh, so let me just pick a letter D. And so we'll let A, D be in A times B intersect C. All right, and we need to show that that is in uh, the intersection on the right-hand side there. Uh, so, okay, so what does it mean that that D is in, the AD is in this this Cartesian product. Well, so uh, from this it follows that. So we're just unwinding definitions here. That D is in B intersect C. I.e., uh, D is in B, and D is in C. Okay, well, from this first thing, so since D is in B, we find that AD is in A times B. While D being in C, implies that AD is in A times C. So therefore, AD must be, so AD is in A cross B and AD is in A cross C, so AD is in A cross B intersect A cross C. And I guess just uh, to sort of wrap up this paragraph, we can just conclude what we with what we showed. Uh, we showed that this set is contained in this one. On the other hand. So you have to show the reverse containment. Suppose that AD is in A cross B intersect A cross C. Well, what does that mean? Then AD is in A cross B and AD is in A cross C. As a consequence, D is in B, right? AD is in A cross B, then D is in B, and AD is in A cross C, so D must be in C as well. All right, so if D is in B and D is in C, just take a look at where we're trying to go. We're trying to show that AD is in A cross B intersect C. Right? So we want to say something about B intersect C, but exactly what we found is that D is in B intersect C. Uh, uh, so thus it follows if 
follows that a comma d is in capital A cross B intersect C. Okay. So here's an alternative proof. which is also provided in the book, uh, which takes a different approach to showing the equality of the sets. And that just proceeds from unwinding the definitions of the sets. And I'll, I'll show you here. So here's an alternative proof. So A cross B intersects C. Well, what is that? So that's the set of x and y. Right? So this is a Cartesian product. So we have two coordinates. And we have x in A and y in B intersect C. Right? Well, logically, y in B intersect C is exactly the same as saying that y is in B and y is in C. Right? So we can say, okay, this is the set of x, y, such that x is in A, and y is in B, and y is in C. Okay. And now to motivate this next bit, uh, let's take a look at where we're trying to go. So where we're trying to go is uh, A cross B intersect A cross C, right? And so what is this? This is the set of X, Y such that, um, such that X, Y is in A cross B. B and x, y is in A cross C, right? Well, that's equal to, so set of x, y, what does it mean logically that x is in, x, y is in A cross B? Well, that means that x is in A and y is in B, and x is in A, and y is in C, right? But this sentence here, so let's see, uh, right, so this here, this is exactly the same thing as this logically, right? Because this x is in A, we have that there. We also have it here, but saying P and saying P and P are exactly logically the same thing, which you can check with a truth table if you don't believe me. But, you know, just so if, if you know that a proposition holds, uh, saying the proposition holds and the proposition holds isn't saying anything new, right? So. So there's no problem with replacing x is in A with x is in A and x is in A, right? And then we have our y is in B, that's here. And our y is in C here, right? So, so basically we just, uh, if you start from one end and expand it out a bit and start from the other end and expand it out a bit, we kind of just meet in the middle here, right? So you can see that these two sets are exactly equal just because the uh, logical structure of the elements is exactly the same. The, the logical, the, the open sentence P of X, Y that has to be satisfied by the pairs X and Y is exactly logically the same thing. Okay, so that's the second proof is you just unwind what the 
what the open sentence describing the elements of uh, the one set is and show that that's exactly logically has the same force as the open sentence describing the elements in the other. Okay, so this is a, uh, a law of, this establishes a kind of distributive law of the Cartesian product uh, over the intersection for sets. And this, this holds generally for any sets A, B, and C. Okay, so there's, a, there's some other examples of laws like this, which are equivalent to De Morgan's laws, um, which you can show, and which I'll probably have you do some exercises about. Uh, but for, for example, uh, so there's other similar laws. So similar. Uh, so for example, uh, let's see. Yeah, so the, the Cartesian product distributes over unions as well. So you should, well, I might, I might assign this officially, but you might want to, you might be interested in just trying to write down what the argument is, uh, write down the proof that these two sets are equal here. Um, and uh, so the book gives a, a full list of them, but there's other ones like, for example, uh, if you have the intersection of two sets and you look at the complement of that set, so say you have some, some universal set, uh, and you're looking at the complement of the intersection, that's the, uh, that's the union of the individual complements. Um, basically because, so, so this is sort of a uh, De Morgan's law for sets. Uh, because on the left-hand side, we have, so A intersect B, that's the set of elements in A and in B, right? So we have a state, an and statement here, and then the complement is the negation of that. So it's the negation of an and statement. And so that should be uh, the, um, so that's the negation of a conjunction. So that should be the disjunction of the negations. And that's exactly what we have on the right-hand side here. Uh, the the uh, disjunction, that's the or statement, and that corresponds to union and then the, uh, the complements corresponding to the not. Um, so actually, formally, that, that follows from the De Morgan law in logic. Right? So this is sort of uh, related to if you have P, um, P and Q and the not of that, that that's equal to not P uh, or not Q. So this law for sets actually really follows from the De Morgan's law uh, in logic, but you can also check at the level of sets. Um, you should be able to check that law. All right, uh, so I think that's going to conclude the lecture. So I'll just say Oh no, what did I do? Maybe I'll go to the to a new clean page. Start again here. Um, so somewhat more sophisticated, or no, not more sophisticated, just just different. Um, is uh, we could consider something like this. So let's say S uh, is a set of numbers. Uh, so this could be contained in the uh, natural numbers or the integers or rational numbers or real numbers. Um, and if we have this, wait a minute. Oh, means uh, I did it.